And uh, I guess, Sam, you're still with Bertelsmann Foundation, yes? Right. Who, you know, uh, and, and you, are, you have directed other films. And uh, Sabia, you are um, still directing films and told me about a new one, which, you know, we'll talk about maybe a little later. But um, I wanted to start, and we'll get to all your questions and your input um, in a little bit. It's been a couple years now since the film came out. What, what do you hear from people about it? What's the reaction? What's the impact? Thank you so much. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I guess you have to. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much for that question. Thank you guys for hanging out with us and um, for participating. And um, and that's why we wanted Corey here. I hope that he's on his way or he's coming. Um, he's with the DC Legacy Project. And so I think that's one of the containers, if you will, for this work to mm -hmm. continue to move forward, engaging um, with the community. Um, we continue to get tremendous responses from this film. There seems to be such a hunger, such a, um, a hole that's been at least partially filled um, by talking about this history, resurrecting this, and making the connections between the past and the present. So I think it's just moving forward, kind of using this history to mobilize people and um, educate people around the need to protect those, these kind of properties, and not just for posterity, not just to commemorate a past, but also to make space for people of different socioeconomic backgrounds as the city continues to develop and, and redevelop in the way that it has. Are people surprised by what they learn in this film? Or, or what's the, I mean, what do you hear is the kind of predominant, I mean, are they kind of, you know, every time I see it, I don't know, I'm, I'm simultaneously fascinated, angry, kind of shocked, I don't know. I really love that you ended with Etta Horn's voice yes. in the film. I guess I, that in the last two times I'd seen it, it didn't strike me, but that was lovely. Anyway, what do you hear? Um, well, I don't know what you're hearing, Sam. I'm getting a lot of, I didn't know. I think that's the yes. most common refrain. Yes. I, didn't I didn't know. know. Right. You know, particularly the um, reconstruction history which I'm learning there's a lot of that across the city and not just in this location. But I think that's one that I'm getting a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about you? Sam, what, what about you? Yeah. Well, first of all, it's fantastic to be here. Thank you. I think, first of all, as the point was made, and, and you know, this is not a brand new film, and, and there's still folks that want to come see it. And I think that's a testament to precisely this kind of deep yearning for more information about this city. So it's it's fantastic to be a part of it. Uh, two comments I want to make. I was so happy you mentioned that Etta Horn bit at the end. Um, that there was a, a a woman that helped consult on this project, um, Sarah Jane Sarah Schoenfeld, and she wrote an article about Berry Farm, and it kept having these quotes from Etta Horn. And I said, "Where is this coming <laughs> from?" So I looked in the bibliography, and it, it, it cited an interview that was buried in like a archive in Wisconsin. Mm. Yes, very interesting. So I contacted this archive in Wisconsin. We contacted them and said, how do you have this? Is this audio? And they said, yeah, down in our basement, we have this audio. And, you know, $20 later, they were able to send us a copy of this audio with permission to use it. And it was so cool because we had been talking about Etta Horn and studying Etta Horn and hearing, mm. hearing people that knew her Oh, I, we had never heard her voice. And then that email That's comes in and all of a sudden there's a voice to a name. And, and I know we talked about the fact that we feature Etta Horn a lot in this. Um, and, and in some ways that was a concern because it was so much more than Etta Horn. And we didn't want to make it seem like this is the only one that was a leader in the community. But the fact that, you know, we had this testimony and we had her voice, I think was really cool. So I was happy that you picked up on that. In terms of the response, I completely agree with everything Dr. Prince has said. One thing that we've also heard, I didn't know. That's the number one thing. But something that makes me feel good is also the people that did know are like, yeah, that's that's true. And I'm glad you, because you, you, we want to accomplish two things with the documentary. You know, you want, on the one hand, teach it to people who don't already know. 
but you also want to do it in a way that the people that do know feel seen and feel good about seeing themselves on screen. And and I think that th that's been very heartwarming too, that the, the response from the former residents has been very positive. I agree. And I'll just say, putting that within a context, mm -hmm. that D.C. is a kind of weird, unique city, <laughs> right? Because it's the federal city. Yeah. And um, there's a level of invisibility that goes on. There's a level of erasure that takes place, not just through gentrification and redevelopment, but just because of its status as a federal city. I know just growing up that there was this always this level of invisibility. I remember people saying, do people actually live there? When I would say that I live in D.C., they were like, kind of like, what? You know what I mean? Mm. So... In that sense, it's unique to be able to, again, remind people that, yeah, folks live here and they've been here for quite a minute and they have quite an attachment to, to the land and to this place. Yeah, it, it is interesting. This question of uniqueness, though, I wanted to ask you both about this because how, you know, this is a portrait of a community that is unique in, and maybe not so unique. And this is what I want to ask you about because, I mean, you have the activism uh, the Band of Angels and Etta Horn and everything coming. I mean, one of my theories, of course, is the spatial layout of the place. I'm an architect, for those that don't know, contributed to the activism and the creativity. And then you have, of course, you know, Junkyard Band and Go-Go. Um, so obviously a, an intensely creative place on a number of levels. How, I mean, that makes it unique or not. Do you think that other erased communities have that level of heft, uh, if you want to call it that, creatively? Um, are we, you know, in our erasures, do we erase lots of this and we just don't know it? Yes. <laughs> I'm going to say yes. I mean, and I'm a social scientist, so I shouldn't go out on limbs. Yeah. I mean, I don't have any, you know, I, I'm a big believer in data. But, <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, it's no reason to believe that that wouldn't be the case, mm -hmm. right? Every community, every sub-community, every neighborhood has flavor, has traditions, you know. And in the black community, we've had various traditions that have been passed down, um, you know, generationally. So... Yeah, I would definitely argue that it's not unique in that way. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's more like the political and the economic structure make it unique, but it overlaps with other spaces too. Nothing is completely and fully unique. That's one of the characteristics of culture, that there's going to be overlap, right, and, and carry over across generations. So, yeah, I don't think it's unique in that sense. I think that's a very valuable Point and it kind of reinforces the things that are lost. Mm -hmm. And I would say relationships are probably one of the main things that get lost in the mix here, and that's also difficult to quantify. Yeah. Sam, I Yeah, know. I really agree with that. I mean, first of all, there's, there's things that certainly make Berry Farm unique, and in that sense, it is a unique story. But definitely one thing that drew me to this and really kind of pulled me in is I learned more about it. So I came to this... Uh, Sabi had done so much research on it, you know, both in terms of historical, but also networking and meeting people. She really did that. And I kind of came on and it was sort of like I was doing more of the technical filming kind of side. And I was kind of learning on the run because I didn't have that background. And what really attracted me to the story was the fact that, OK, yes, it's very unique. There's only one. But at the same time, there were beats that really resonated for the city and for the country. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Berry Farm is a small area, right, comparatively. It's not, it's not, it doesn't take you all that long to drive through it or walk through it. So it's, it's sort of this little area, but in it, it has this much bigger story of displacement that you could tell that story of displacement in Washington by basically picking up a stone and throwing it in any of the four cardinal directions, and you're going to hit a neighborhood that was once mm -hmm. had a tremendous most likely African-American history that was getting pushed away. And then there's also, you know, beats in the story. It starts with, with slavery, the, 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 in, the, the inhumanity of slavery, and the unfairness, the, the deeply rooted unfairness of how it ended and how land was distributed. Um, it has to do with the migration of African-Americans from the South to other cities in the North. This is a major part of American history. 
It has to do with civil rights. It has to do with music. It has to do with the difficult period in divestment of the 1980s. And in this way, it's kind of a national story playing out in this relatively small area. So yeah. that, that was an appeal of the story for me. Yeah, and one of the powerful things that you both do in the film, and, uh, you know, Sabia is the narrator, if you didn't hear that. The also voice, her art. The, there we go. Her art in it too. Yeah. One of the powerful things is that it really does, you tie it back to, you know, pre, even pre Freedmen's Bureau days when, you know, Oliver um, Howard was actually, you know, buying the land um, and doing, I, I mean, it really, you know, back, back, back when, you know, Washington became a hub for, you know, black people to, to come. Um, and that is that that sense of time is is powerful on this particular site, um, and that is just I yeah, it's and have decisions made yeah hundreds of years ago ripple. It magnifies the sense of loss that I feel every time I see this film. <laughs> it's tough, right? Um, you know, Sabia, we're talking a little bit about. Uh, uh, this before the screening, but you say that um, it's I, and I it's been everywhere. This film recently. I mean, it, if you watch public TV, WHUT, Howard, you know, public TV had screened it multiple times. But you said it also had been shown, or you had shown it to a number of DC uh, decision makers, people in the administration. Uh, what I mean is, it going to change their behavior and okay I'll go out on a limb here I'm a I worry that we are in um, an era when we pay a lot of mind to developers uh, do you think people are gonna in that are making these decisions about who gets to make decisions about the land are gonna change their ways a bit or well I've learned a lot about politics and politicians over the last few years <laughs> Good. working with Empower DC, and I wouldn't rule anything out. I think um, people are motivated by different things. Their decisions are based on so many factors, mm -hmm. and I'm deeply appreciative of the organizing work of Empower DC because I think they've been very strategic, and it's important to acknowledge that when you're doing this kind of work, it's, it can be a slow pace. Like community-based organizing is not something that goes rapidly at the same pace that, say, mm -hmm. electoral politics and some of the, you know, different level of work. It goes very quickly, and there's a lot of urgency. And, and we've moved very incrementally by saying, you know, we're going to highlight this history, and we're going to try to pull people in and, and kind of calling people out and pulling them in at the same time. Um, what kind of things motivate politicians? I think it's also about understanding the psychology of that. Mm -hmm. People want to be remembered. Uh, they don't want to be humiliated publicly. Um, they want to, you know, look good in front of others. They want to make it seem like they're doing things. So you just have to, like, catch them at the right moment with the right information and the right strategies to say, hey, you know, do you want to get on board with this. This is something that's very valuable. It's very important to the community in different levels. And, you know, some people talk about caring about the community and sometimes they don't necessarily. So it's not about, it's about changing people's behavior and to some extent changing their hearts and their minds or maybe just their behavior, maybe not their hearts and minds. Maybe mm -hmm. they just want to look good and you've just caught them at the right moment. But I think we're working on different levels with this. You know, and I think it is possible so you, to have you, something. So you're still optimistic that things will... I am because the organizing is continuing mm -hmm. and we're bringing people over to our side bit by bit. We have funders who are poised to support the work. We have an architecture firm who's put forth plans for redeveloping the properties. We've been engaging community members for years to get their ideas. What do you want to see in this space? and something that can benefit everyone. Oh, so it's a it's okay. a win-win on some levels. Um, someone may lose from the standpoint that if you want to take these buildings and turn it into something that's completely privatized and accessible to the ordinary person, 
if that's what you want, then you would be the loser in this if it turns out the way that we want it to. So yeah, I do remain optimistic. I do remain a believer in organizing because I've seen the positive impacts that can be generated through grassroots organizing. That's that's great. And it still sounds like there's a conversation happening around what will ultimately happen. Oh I mean, yeah, it's happening. It kind of leads to my next question. And Sam, you can definitely respond to um, that previous question if you want. But do, are you in touch with the displaced residents now? Could you, I mean, are you, is there a sort of second film in this where you kind of tell their story in the future of, do they return? I mean, there's a lot of speculation by them in the film about, you know, that. Well, that's the good thing about, again, being rooted in organizing and, 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 a, and an organization that's been working in this community for a long time. So, yeah, those relationships remain. Um, and uh, is there another film? Possibly, but you know what? There's other neighborhoods. <laughs> yeah. There's other neighborhoods that we can move on to and we can highlight that are experiencing similar things, whether it's environmental injustices or more displacement or mm -hmm. the like. So, you know. I'm going to ask you to talk about your new film in a minute. But Sam, did you want to, did you want to? Uh, well, I mean, in terms of uh, the optimism, I just don't, <laughs> I don't think I have enough depth of experience to really know what's going to happen now. I'll say this, that I came to Washington in either 2010 or 2011, and I feel like the dialogue has changed radically since I've come. The awareness of gentrification, the concern about it. I think the fact that we've been, the response to this film and another one we worked on together called Go Go City that's on, I should say we both, we work for nonprofit organizations. Our films are available online and they're free. In, in the case of Bertelsmann Foundation, that's bfnadocs.org. Sorry for the plug. I get in trouble. No, this is, do it. this is good. Um, <laughs> um, I think the, the response to those films shows that the dialogue has changed. Now, how valuable is that? Because on the one hand, I think you have an awareness that you didn't have when I first moved here. There's definitely awareness, a concern, and a, and a desire for something different. So that's one side. On the other side, you just have this intense momentum of you know the change and the and the displacement and so what does it take to interrupt that kind of momentum so right. I, I'm, I'm not sure what direction it'll go before we get to the new film so the the empower dc is a community how would you describe it i mean it's a community action community activist organization it's been around for a while it's a grassroots, grassroots organization founded in 2003. And, uh, and they have campaigns, which shift over time because they are grassroots. They don't set agendas necessarily, but they interact with community members. And, and they, when they understand what needs the community members have or what they want them to be active on, they do that. So key campaigns right now have been, anti-gentrification right. has been, a long-standing one. Sometimes it comes in different forms, like anti-privatization or standing up for the schools that were being privatized and turned into charters and the like. Uh, environmental justice is another one, and racial equity. Those are three big campaigns. It's so interesting that, I, and they produced the film, right? They were the producers. Co-produced with the with, Bertelsmann Foundation. With Bertelsmann, right. It's so interesting that they're in the film space as a community. I wonder how many other kind of community action activist I think organizations it's a shift. have been able to do this at the I scale. I think it's a shift That's that people are understanding the power of yeah. storytelling to communicate with people in addition to statistics and numbers and yeah. reports. Just this is what's going on. Let the folks speak for themselves. And it's kind of more persuasive, I feel. So after all this time, do, you, do each of you have a favorite part of your film? Or favorite, Good question. yeah. Good question. I you want to? I I got I got two that come to mind. I'm sure I could think about it. But yeah. first of all, discovery hearing Etta Horn, Etta Horn's voice <laughs> after learning so much about her, but not being able to find it, and then suddenly just on the laptop hearing that voice come out and getting to use that was super cool. And then for me, like I really like go go music, and within go go music, I really like junkyard band. And when I did the first documentary that had to do with go go music, I didn't really get to include them that much as the scheduling didn't work out. But to be able to feature them, and then we got to go, 
we actually interviewed them at their practice space. And once we finished the interview, they were like, all right, let's practice. And it basically just turned into a live concert that Sabia and I got to enjoy. So that was fantastic. That's good. For me, well, I am a Pisces, which means I could cry at a toilet paper commercial. Um, so I would measure my favorites as the pieces that make me feel with emotion. Mm -hmm. and kind of make me get a little choked up. And it's like, how many times do I have to see this thing where I'm not going to get choked up? And it's like, I'm waiting for that to happen. But um, the part about the Great Migration, it's something about the music and mm -hmm. that transition. It shows that image of people at the bus station. Mm -hmm. I always think about my grandparents, and it makes mm -hmm. me feel very emotional. Mm -hmm. um, and there's something about the ending where the women embrace, and that also makes me feel a certain way. I, mm. I, I think about ancestors. It makes mm. me think about our ancestors and all the things that they've gone through. And it makes me wish that I could be with them. Not in terms of dying, but, yeah. and, <laughs> but you know, just in terms of, of hearing them and being with them again. Because it's so important, those cross-generational relationships. Mm. So it makes me think about that. So tell us about your current film. Really excited to be working with Sam and a team of great um, filmmakers, all individual filmmakers in their own right, um, in a film called Diminished Returns, looking at the um, racial wealth gap in Washington, D.C. And it's going to be a three-act um, film that looks at the origins of the gap, the impacts of the gap, and also solutions so that we don't end negatively, which is just telling people about a lot of inequities, but also talking about what folks are doing. Um, locally and across the nation to mend this gap. Yeah, I just want to say I've been tracking this project from the beginning, offering, you know, whatever help I can. And it's it's a fantastic film. And uh, definitely, definitely keep your eyes out. Because it's probably not going to... Do you have a release date in mind? End of March, we're looking at. Gonna it's going to hit hard. Whenever it hits, it's going to hit hard. It's really a, it's really a good film. Mm -hmm. Let, let's open it up. Uh, who's got questions, comments... Reaction. I can. And a microphone. Oh, Polly, are you really going to do the whole kind of walk thing? Okay. Oh, good. <laughs> so, the chicken and the egg are very cooperative. So, I mean, there's been a lot of projects that have taken place in, in DC that sound similar to me of, the, of a, a Hope Six like with Thurston Quarter, another challenged neighborhood. But in that case, there was the displacement with the, with the opportunity to come back or, or, uh, down in, in Southeast at uh, the former, oh, I'm at a brain fart. Let me get to it. You, you demolish, but ideally there is something that's going to replace it. That is housing and amenities, et cetera. In the case of Berry Farms, why hasn't that happened? Why hasn't that occurred? I think that would depend on who you ask. But first of all, the redevelopment is not even popping off. I don't know if you've been over there. but. Oh, Right, the land has been broken for the senior building, and that mm -hmm. is actually a common um, practice, to is first. to get the seniors in first. Um, but this is going to be six to eight years. So, you know, I've talked to people that were displaced from uh, through Hope Six at Arthur Caper Carrollsburg. People pass away before people can even get back in there. I mean, we have to deal with the realities of these things take a very long time. And what is the true motivation? Is the motivation to actually bring people back? Because there are a lot of structural barriers involved. Right. So um, Ellie Walton, who's the director of photography for the film I'm making now, she did a short film about the first black woman that came back to Arthur Caper Carrollsburg. And what she documented was... That was profoundly difficult for her to get back. Why? Because they tell you, number one, if you want to come back, you have to attend meetings, a prerequisite number of meetings. That means you have to respond in a timely fashion to mail. Where are you living? Are you homeless? Do you have a permanent address? Are you couch surfing with mm -hmm. different people? That's an immediate structural barrier to people getting that message. Then you have to come to these meetings. Are you a wage worker? Do you have child care? What time is the meeting? I don't have the luxury, maybe if you're a food service worker, to come to any meeting any bloody time you want to. So that's another barrier. You don't make those meetings, you're done. You don't have an opportunity to come back. Um, we have affordability issues, right? Because the AMI is very high. The 
barrier is also getting higher and higher about what's considered affordable. So that also yep. cuts a lot of people off. So there, and I could go on and on. Um, it is a process, and that's why you have to keep fighting, shaming, uh, you know, whatever is involved, civil disobedience, organizing the whole nine. You have to do it, and you have to do it consistently, and that's hard. That takes resources, and it takes time. I just want to put an exclamation point on that, all those barriers you mentioned. Now we were saying, well, this film has been out for a while, right? It's made the rounds. Well, this film, I mean, this people had already been displaced for a while, right? For a, a couple of years, and the film came yeah. out. Now it's been a couple. So all those barriers, then you add in that time, and there only still is still an open field now. So those barriers, people just get further and further away. And, you know, as you say, people that are already dealing with different addresses, all the barriers you said, and we're still years away from anybody coming back. So it's almost, it's like a, a, a waiting out the clock thing. Mm. Frustrating. Uh, yes, ma'am. And then, sir. Quick question. Uh, the bonus minutes, have any of them compensated before the eviction? No. They were not given any, like, relocation or moving expenses? They were given support. I don't know if it came in the form of expenses. I don't believe it did. It came in the form of just some sort of, like, you know, here, this is a phase. This is your first phase. And certain groups are going to be responsible for moving. And then phase two, you will move in then phase three. They weren't given resources, but they were given support. As the gentleman said, Mr. Coleman Hall, that someone came and helped to help him pack up. I believe that was because he was slow it's in leaving. Eviction. It's, it's eviction. Um, and one thing I would also say, the people that are organized tend to get better housing when they are evicted, when they have to leave. And the people who were holdouts and who said, you know, I'm not going to rush this. I'm going to stay and I'm going to hang and I'm going to fight. Those are the people that tended to get better options uh, toward the end. Anybody who's kind of speaking out and not just accepting whatever anyone's mm -hmm. telling them tend to be, you know, things turn out better for them. So do you mean like, were they compensated monetarily? I, no, I don't mean that. I just mean... Um, getting the housing options that may be more desirable for them, not accepting anything that anybody gives to you, but saying, no, I don't want to go there because maybe it's not safe, or this is not going to be a good place for me because I have this number of children. I need this number of, you know, whatever. There's a lot of different options, not a lot, but there are different types of housing that's both public and or subsidized in the city. Section 8 vouchers? Yes. Yeah. And that's very, very problematic. There are penalties about families, family structure, and as far as I know, they are um, actually worsening, particularly if you understand that with Berry Farm, those units were actually rather large units. And so you had people that were living in multi-generational situations, and now they're being moved into spaces where not only are there could be gender restrictions, but there are also age restrictions and situations where elders cannot their children or their grandchildren. The original deed holders own the land or were they renting the land? They were owners. They purchased owners. plots so through the Freedmen's Bureau. Those How did those go down There's this the thing called eminent domain, which you will see playing out across the city in different other neighborhoods so where people lost, they, they took it for the larger a mission of building public housing in this case. But those deed holders weren't necessarily rent living there. They could have been living up in Chevy Chase and owning a few plots of land there. Did, do you have any history about how that works? It's just a tons of black families that were living there. And there's a book by um, a woman who was a curator at the Anacostia Community Museum who's in the film, Alcione Amos. And she wrote a nice book about her. And this guy read it from cover to yeah, cover. Yeah, it helped a lot. <laughs> That's how I caught up. Please. I'm wondering, um, because the reason I, this is why I'm here, is that, you know, I knew of Barry Farm, I've been here since the late 60s, but I've maybe driven by a couple of times. But the reason, you know, that I don't know about it has a greater pulse, and I'm thinking that Nietzsche 
feel this way too, is because the tide is rising in terms of so many of our neighborhoods and what were the neighborhoods we love that have their own idiosyncratic natures and there's this push towards gentrification that um, the, the displacement pulse, you know, I'm in Mount Pleasant, which has changed radically and we have, you know, little apartment cities like Woodner and Park Region and so there's kind of these pieces, these beautiful pieces are a pulse, but it's coming together to a larger network of what makes a city. And we can't, we don't want to erase populations. And I, so I think there's sort of the heart and soul in your small piece. And I'm wondering if you see that as part of your mission too, is this larger pulse making thing of, you know, what makes a whole city and not erasing populations. Mm. Mm. That's a big question. It's undoubtedly a part of my mission to uplift my city, a city that I was born in, and just, you know, as I've gotten older and older, learning more about, and really been deprived of an opportunity to really understand it um, growing up. So that's been a part of my mission, as well as uplifting vulnerable populations, too, and kind of bringing an anthropological Lens, lens to filmmaking, whatever that looks like. Hi, so much for this. Um, I'm very happy I finally got to see it. I'm a professor at the University of the District of Columbia and one of Corey Shaw's professors. Do you know where Corey is? <laughs> I don't know where Corey is, but I wanted to say, um, I wanted to come to support for showing this. I didn't get to see it when it was screened at UBC, last, I think it was last year. Yeah. So, um, because I was away and I'm a relatively new faculty member. I'm also a social scientist, I'm a political scientist. So my question actually is about the tension between choosing to title the film Barry Farm and in the film, the, the kind of association with that name, they wanted to change yeah. the name. So um, that, that is that tension. And the reason I wanna bring this up is for two reasons. Um, DC statehood is a big thing and it is a big grassroots movement as well. Some of the biggest arguments against DC statehood is because DC can't be a state because it has no rural farmland. Um, and I say that in big scare quotes because this is some of the testimony that's been given in Congress by representatives that come from proper states. Again, I'm putting it in scare quotes. So I wonder how you see in doing this work emphasizing the, the kind of agricultural history of DC helping us collectively think about Yeah, well, first of all, it's a good question. And I think s smart people can come down. So Hillcrest, right, was the, you had, uh, Hillsdale, Hillsdale. Hillsdale, excuse me, uh, can come down on different opinions on this. And it's certainly something we talked about. I can just tell you how I saw it. So there was a time, let's say, was it the 19th century, early 20th century, when, when there was a group of people that said, let's call it Hillsdale. And for reasons that were essentially racist, their opinion was ignored, and it went on for another century called Berry Farm. Now, to me, everybody who I interviewed, who we interviewed, excuse me, everybody we interviewed about this project that lived there knew it 100% as Berry Farm. That's what it was to them. That's, and to me, what it, it would feel out of place for me to come in and say, well, actually, it was called Hillsdale. <laughs> You know, like that would be doing exactly what I didn't want to do. And I feel like that happens sometimes that in like the academic community, people will come with a point um, and sort of override with the locals. So I thought it was, in my opinion, and when we had these conversations and we've had these conversations multiple times, and so I'd be, you know, feel free to add, but the way I thought of it is this is an important chapter that we had to focus on and make sure we say it clearly, but that I didn't think that it should impact um you know it should override what the people here knew it as and wanted to talk about when they sat down to answer sabia's questions i think really the biggest debate about the name was is it farm or farms yeah. um, that was like the thing mm -hmm. you know i mean yeah people identify with um the name berry farm and i think it's a conundrum and it's something for us to talk about and if Sarah Schoenfeld were here, she's, um, you know, was in the film and and she graduated from Wilson. Mm 
Mm. And they've changed their name. Right. And Jackson she Reed, yeah. is a very ardent, anti-racist, native Washingtonian, been at it for a long time. But she didn't want them to change the name. Mm. Because she thought, um, I think she can express it better than I can, but I think she feels like there's something in that for people to have that conversation and understand the history and the trajectory of the city and the school and all of that. So, um, yeah, we never really quibbled over. It's called Berry Farm. Everybody knows it is Berry Farm. And I will also add that this debate actually speaks to some class tensions mm. that do exist in that space mm. because the people that were living there initially before the public housing were homeowners. And, and some of them were hoity-toity folk, um, you know, and so there was tension. Mm. They didn't necessarily want to have public housing near them, and there was uh, attitudes toward public housing residents. And so the Hillsdale piece, in a sense, represents that, as you saw during that segment where they highlighted highly educated people, et cetera. So that's a part of that tension, too. Sure. Uh, I just, before we move on to the next question, it, if all that's standing between statehood and, and, and D.C. is the uh, absence of agricultural land, I'm challenging you, D.C. You have a, a rooftop garden. Uh, <laughs> you're you're our, our only urban land grant in college in the U.S. I know. Let's put urban ag everywhere and on rooftops, and maybe Things we can be a state. There we go. I definitely agree. Do you, with yeah, so okay, good, good stuff. Work. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> I think there was a hand. Oh, you had a hand up. No, we, I, I went to Council um, over in Anacostia at the St. Elizabeth campus. It used to call it 801. It was a men's home and shelter. And I had a van, and we would drive through Berry Farm as a shortcut to get into the city. And I can remember the men talking about it. So when I saw the young mm. boys' faces, that's what was very dear to me. I thought, well, that's what my men were talking about because they used to love, they, they loved playing and living at Berry Farm. Mm -hmm. And many of them are still mm -hmm. up there in the men's shelter. Mm -hmm. That is interesting. Well, I had a very poignant experience after the demolition and the last folks were moved away. I can remember driving through there and seeing a bunch of young men hanging out, mm -hmm. but there was nothing there. And they were there to connect with people that they had grown up with or were friends with. And I think it was a reflection, again, of the destruction of their social networks and their sense of belonging. Because, And actually, around that time, you did see an uptick of violence. Because I think people are noting that folks are losing their social networks. They're losing their anchors and their moorings. And they're also living in other neighborhoods where they don't know people or where there may be hostilities or where people may look at them suspiciously. So their sense of belonging is being undermined. And I think it's important for us to understand the web of connections and how that can cause other mm -hmm. societal fractures when you demolish people's communities and their sense of belonging yeah. and the ties that they have with each other. Yeah. yeah. saw some of the Barry Farm Recreation Center, mm -hmm. modern building, that was built about the same time the whole place was demolished. So it clearly serves somebody other than the former residents of Barry Farm. And it will serve some other people in the future mm -hmm. as they redevelop. And that's why this work is important, to create spaces. But that rec center, I have to say, I've talked to people, maybe you have too, where they're like, that Rec Center meant a lot to me. I mean, people from all over the city, they're like, mm -hmm. I came there. Mm -hmm. I learned how to swim there or et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, That's a good point because it looks very modern. So there must have been something in the same space mm -hmm. with that function prior mm -hmm. to the more modern building that we see now. Right. Mm -hmm. The rec. Yeah. People talk about the rec in the oral histories. Mm -hmm. They talk about the rec. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, regarding the, um, the land, since here in Hayden, you were saying there's no development around the District of Columbia, there are certain pockets of the city where they do outdoor screens of just actual movies. Have you guys thought about doing that on that land? That would be 
exactly. Interesting yeah. idea. Oh, yeah. Bring the residents there and to make some more buzz to the mayor's office and say, hey, what's happening here? We need to do something. That's a great idea. Oh, yeah, yeah. We have thought about that. Yep, we definitely have. And when the weather gets better, hopefully we'll have that. Um, we do not have control over that. Just to understand that um, the city has leased that land to a developer that's based in Chicago. Um, so anything that we want to do there, we would have to go through the proper channels. Um, Is this POA? Yeah, POA. Okay. Mm -hmm. But there's, there have been a number of screenings in the neighborhood, including real mm -hmm. big ones at churches. Oh, yeah. Uh, like 200 people coming. So. I think it would mean so much more to each other to own that land. Yeah. It's a great idea. Surprise how many people will come back. Agreed. It's a great idea. Oh, my yeah. God. Oh, yeah. There we go. Yes. Yep. Uh, it's, there's some complications there politically with the rec. Um, but yeah, and it does, there's a charge as well. Mm. That's not small. I don't know, whoever, um, one of us can tell the story about how we tried to get that in. And it just, we just ran out of time in terms of making a connection with them, so. Yeah, we talked to uh, Miles, and I think it would have worked out. I think that, you know, on a project like this, you get to a point where you just got to accept that you can't do everything. I mean, this covers like 300 years of history in, in 50 minutes, and that's a disservice in a way. You cannot tell a full story. And I think at a certain point, you just have to accept that. But sometimes we'll get the question, is there anything you wish you could have included? And I always have that as my answer. And the thing about it is those basketball games, I mean, they were incredibly uh, important cultural events. It's also like fantastic basketball yeah, being no, played amazing. there. It was like known throughout the country as some of the most competitive, you know, uh, open air kind of basketball that was occurring. And that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and if Miles assigned a nickname to somebody, it's stuck with happens the way my neighborhood, which is Rhode Island Avenue, it's crazy. Uh, I'll leave that as a question. What does the uh, plan for Berry Farms, what is it close to as far as uh, public transportation? Who is going to live there? Great question. Well, it's in Anacostia, so you do have metro there, you have the river there. I think you have to reimagine a complete transformation um, and imagine it, I guess, in the context of other things that have happened across the city, as you are doing. Um, there are plans that everyone can see. You can go online, you can look up POA, the Preservation of Affordable Housing, that is an acronym that's what it stands for. So you can go, you can search Berry Farm Development, however you want to search it, so you can see the plans for yourself. Um, I think what often happens in situations like this um, is the developers try to put the very best face on things that they can. That's a part of the process. When you're trying to get buy-in, emotional or psychological buy-in, you present people with awesome renderings. 
and you tell them you're going to be living here as well. This is all fabulous and you're going to be here too. But of course, we know that there's structural and all kinds of logistical factors that relate to that. So um, I think what's going to be there is partially what they plan, but it also can shift based on the response of the people and the extent to which people organize and put pressure on their elected officials. So that's going to determine ultimately. Right now, we have these five buildings that that's what we're fighting for on one front. The DC Legacy Project is doing that. The DC Legacy Project is under the umbrella of Empower DC. They've been active for a minute, and they're going to continue to fight for the rights of the people who were displaced to return. So that's like a two-pronged strategy, if you will. One focusing on preservation, which is a lot more palatable and a little less radical, um, but can also be persuasive. Then on the other side, you're fighting for housing rights and for people to come back and for real affordability and those kind of things. I've seen the renderings and, um, you know, while I don't know if that's what's going to be built, it's going to be, it, most of the new buildings will be not single family attached houses that are two stories. They will be apartment houses. Uh, they will be at least four stories. Um, but, you know, it, 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 you alluded to this earlier. I mean, the Berry Farm dwellings were, you know, a big family could fit in that house. So now I'm assuming that it will be typically two bedrooms, maybe. And then the other thing that is on, you know, kind of publicly available is that um, it's, I mean, the, the renderings are very, you know, zooty and kind of, you know, oh, looks real good, as you were, you were saying. But um, there is going to be market rate housing mixed in. It's not just going to be a it's not just affordable. It's mixed. No, it's it's mixed yeah, it's mixed income and mixed use because the the ground floor will be, as the Jen in the film says, you yeah. know, it's going to be. It sounds like chain franchises. Yeah. That was such yeah. A cool yeah. 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 Exactly. It's no. So. This whole discussion, like somebody said earlier, when you drive by now, it's just a big field. I think that's why it's such an important time to have this conversation because to your question you're like what happens next it could go different ways and we can imagine the best case scenario um, that could happen we can also imagine a worst case scenario which to me you know maybe it's an extension of what's happened in navy yard uh, where you just get these kind of high-rise buildings that have no connection to anything that's ever happened before and no sort of local flair or local feel and people willing to pay a lot of money to live there. Um, because again, it's like two different understandings of land. Like for, and that's again, was a cool thing at the beginning of the film. For some people it was home, you know, it was history. It was my mother had cookouts here, but seen from another light, it's a gold mine. I mean, look at that land, you're on water, a tremendous view of the United States Capitol. You're a 10 minute drive to the White House. There's a Metro there. I mean. So, but, but now's the time where if, if you can get in somebody's ear, and, and maybe that's what this film can do, and maybe that's what people who see this film can do, you know, the answer is as, as yet to be determined. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Thank that's you, right. filmmakers. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Sabia. So good to be with you.